There's nothing I love more than getting my hands into the soil. And my mission for the next 13 weeks is to give you the tools that you'll need to get out in the garden and get a little dirty yourself. That way, together, we can continue to build a greener world. Tonight, how to create your very own edible landscape can be a fabulous celebration of colours and create what is a really strong ornamental garden out of purely vegetable plants. Using natives as an effective screen, it will deflect the wind. It's not, it's not a barrier like this. You can't stop the wind. <laughs> and the start of our backyard revolution. Oh, yeah. One, two, three. Hooray! Let's do it. Now, I believe that we all can make a difference no matter how big or small. But where to start? Our backyards. In this series, I'm going to undertake one of the most important projects to date, showing you step by step how you can take your typical backyard in the suburbs and transform it into the type of backyard that I believe every Australian should have a productive, abundant and sustainable haven. And a little later in the show, just around the corner from here, an unsuspecting family is about to take the first steps in Australia's backyard revolution. But first, there's something I want to show you. And it's one of the things I hope to incorporate into the backyard revolution, the concept of edible landscapes, that is, creating beautiful gardens from fruit and vegetable plants. And there's no better example of edible landscapes than at this spectacular garden estate in Dramana, some 50 kilometres south of Melbourne. You can't help but feel this garden jumping out of the ground around you. We're at Heronswood on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, and it's a feast for the senses. Your eyes are stimulated by the flowers and the colours and the textures. The wind is blowing in the breeze and you can hear it. You can smell the scents of these beautiful flowers. Today, we're going to explore the fact that you can not only have a beautiful garden, but you can eat it too. You might remember from our first odyssey, the spectacular Heron's Wood. It's a two hectare showcase garden and the home of Digger's Seeds. What I saw last time and just had to come back to show you is the groundbreaking way the gardeners here create edible landscapes. Tim, this garden is just so full of colours and textures. What's the purpose of it? It's really about showcasing all the, all the interesting varieties of heirloom vegetables that you can grow in your backyard. You know, a vegetable garden doesn't have to be a boring, straight lines, you know, green kind of garden. It can be a fabulous celebration of colours. We've got red chard, yellow chard, all the interesting colours and textures that you can throw together and, and create what is essentially a really strong ornamental garden out of purely vegetable plants. Traditionally, veggie patches can be messy and untidy looking usually stuck up the back of the yard. But with a little bit of imagination, you too can create an edible landscape that you'd be proud to have at the front of your house. Having come from a Mediterranean background, my grandfather, he didn't just grow his vegetables out the back. He grew plants because he loved them. He loved snow peas like this for their colour, but then you get these beautiful produce and he had them across the front of the house, which for, for most people would be like, oh, what do you mean? That's not what you put on the front of the house. But the point of this garden bed here is there's no rules. What I love about it, look at the texture of this rhubarb. I mean, that's a beautiful plant that you could use as a design element, as an understory. And then what about a border? I mean, a lot of people think that a border has to be some traditional thing just like a buxus. Forget it. Look at this thyme. It smells beautiful. It hedges up fantastic. 
there's these wonderful purple flowers, and all of a sudden, you've got something that not only looks good, creates a beautiful form, but it also smells good, and you can pick it and use it in your cooking. There's no rules as to where you put these wonderful plants. They're, they're, they're not committed to one area or the other. Look at this, nasturtium. That's another border. If you want to be a bit more rambly, look at it. Beauty is, this is edible. The leaves are fantastic. The flowers, you can get these flowers and just sprinkle them over the top of your salad and create a beautiful artistic salad. The rules on these things are not limited to veggies out the back. You can mix them, you can play with them, you can have a ball with them. Now, using veggies in an edible landscape may be one thing, but Tim is even being adventurous with the way he's using his fruit trees. Tim, people tend to think of hedges and they immediately think of buxus or marais, traditional things. You're experimenting with some wonderful new things. Tell me about them. Yeah, we're trying to experiment by putting some edible plants into the landscape as, as hedging plants. We've got the avocado hedge, which replaced a, a, a hedge of camellias that was here about four or five years ago. Now, the avocado, I mean, that grows into a big tree. How does it cope with being hedged, though? Well, the first thing is to pick the right variety. This is a variety called Wurtz, which is actually a dwarfing form of avocado. Um, it grows to probably about five or six metres, but we're going to keep it trimmed to about three metres and create a nice, lush, green hedge here. Um, it's not going to be a formally clipped hedge like in a, in a square box. It'll be more of an informal hedge. And a lot of the skill in getting an avocado to grow like a hedge is in the timing. Now you wouldn't cut it because it's covered in flour. You'd cut it at the end of the season when the new season's wood's hardened up and then it'll respond to that the following Burst year. Burst out from there. Yeah. Fantastic. And over here, you've got good old rosemary and you've shaped it. Yeah, you can do this with anything, but this hedge here being a, a Tuscan blue rosemary, which is quite a tall growing one, we, we decided to give it a bit of, a, a bit of an angle, a bit of, a, bit of interest, and given it this triangle form, which really works well to contrast with the, with the more informal plantings behind it. Another advantage to this edible landscape style is the creation of plant diversity. That is, by putting a selection of different plants together, they become stronger and more pest resistant. Well, you confuse the pests by having lots of combinations of colours and textures. Um, things like caterpillars and particularly cabbage moth love to find a row in a, in a lovely straight it. line and they just go and munch away along. If you've got them all mixed up, they tend to get a bit more confused. You can watch a cabbage moth when it's flying in. In a garden like this, <laughs> you can see it sort of go, wow, well, I don't know where to go. But what I like most about edible landscapes are that not only do they repel pests, they also can create a living artwork in your garden. Look at the wonderful effect that can be achieved by using these different plants and combining them as they've been done here. This is a really strong visual element. But what have we got? Golden marjoram. Up the back, we've got some beautiful grey texture of the curry plant. I mean, you could use this along the entry to your house, down a long driveway. You could be way back and you've just got this huge grey statement with the brightness of the yellow, and best of all, they're not just there in the garden to look at, you can eat them and cook them too. So, you're inspired, but you're not sure where to start. Then make sure you keep watching, because later in the program, I'm gonna show you some great examples of edible planting combinations for your garden. But while I'm here on the Mornington Peninsula, how are you, Costa? I'm fantastic. It's great Thank to you. be here. Rama Vemula has asked me to pop down to the beautiful Sri Shiva Vishnu Temple to help them with a bit of a problem they're having on the edge of the car park. Constructed this in the year 1994 yeah. with the help of the volunteers. The temple sits on a flat landscape and is constantly buffeted by the prevailing wind. Ten years ago, they planted a windbreak and even though the trees are doing well, on their own, they're simply not quite doing the job that they should. The plan for today is to improve this shelter belt to actually make it work. At the moment, the large eucalypts are fine. They've grown, they've established, but the lower understory hasn't. The wind blows through here and they get up to 10,000 people surrounding this area during big festivals. So they want to try and break the wind. So what we're going to do is install a variety of understory plants 
to grow up to one to two metres, not only will it be a nice shelter belt, it's also a wildlife corridor, and at the same time, it helps to create a screen for the highway, which is only about 200 metres over there. The challenge here is to find plants that will thrive in these harsh conditions, as well as support each other as they grow. And to do that, we're not just going to need natives, we're going to need local natives. Here at the community-run Karam Indigenous Nursery, Alison Cuter grows and sells plants that are as local as you can possibly get. The plants here are indigenous to this area means that they grow naturally in this environment. I mean, taken thousands and thousands of years to sort of adapt to this climate, why try to fiddle with it? So Alison, up at the temple near the car park, we've, we've got an existing belt like this of the main trees, but what we need is the understory. What can you recommend? Okay, you can sort of look at um, things like Lepidosperma, uh, the Lamandras. They'll sort of make nice little sort of tufty, tufty growths. But uh, yeah, these plants are going to just love it over at the temple. Anyway, go. The beauty of coming to somewhere like Karam Indigenous Nursery is that you get to see demonstration garden beds that illustrate the plants in real time, exactly how big they're going to be. So this Acacia mernsii, look at it, we're seeing it as a three and a half metre plant and standing back, there's your screen, there's the wind belt. That's what, that's what we want to try to achieve by having the eucalyptus, the canopy, the middle story and then our ground cover with some interesting textures of the lamandra in the front. I mean, that is a true demonstration garden for my liking. After the break, we'll finish the screen and look at some edible planting combinations for your garden. Here at the Hindu temple on the outskirts of Melbourne, I'm about to help plant 350 trees and shrubs as we build the ultimate native windbreak. Thanks everyone for coming. This is a fantastic group that we've got together. So Alison, how are we going to do this today? Well, we've got such a fantastic group of people here. I think we'll get teamwork going and we'll have them in by lunchtime. <laughs> All of the people here today are volunteers from the local community and for many of them this is a unique opportunity to share in the simple joy of getting together and planting trees. So Prima, where are you from? Sri Lanka. What's it like here for you? Oh, uh, main thing in our country, ethnic fighting, you know. No choice, we have to move somewhere. That's and why you, we choice. you came to Melbourne? Melbourne. We usually come to this Hindu temple. My husband doing all the building supervision. Prima's husband, Navar, couldn't make it today. But for the last 20 years, he's donated his engineering skills to build the temple. He is the structural engineer. What's it like to look at it and think that he's been such a big part of it? Happy. Happy. Something we did. Good thing. <laughs> You're proud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right on the boundary of the car park, I'm going to put this one, which was our sticky daisy. It grows up to this high, quite dense, so that'll provide that immediate screen that when you get out of the car, you won't see through it. You won't see beyond it. In just three years, these plants will create a windbreak that works, that looks good, and above all, will act as a thriving native ecosystem. So rather than plant just one big long row, of one species, mix it up, celebrate the diversity, play with the combinations, and enjoy the fact that in recreating nature, you'll actually build a stronger garden. Back at Heronswood, and I'm gonna use the gardens here as my inspiration to show you a couple of edible plant combinations 
that you can build at your place. The first garden we're going to build is for our hotter, drier landscapes, more tending towards a Mediterranean style. So I've gone with a pomegranate. That'll grow up, provides beautiful coloured fruit, and it'll be our feature at the back of our bed. In front of that, I thought I'd go with a lemon verbena. Incredible scent. You can pick the leaves off, they do really well, just steeped in some hot water. I've decided to go with these salvias or sage as our ground story. And as you stomp your way through your garden and you tread on it, it smells great. Our next garden bed is for the temperate zone. Those areas pretty much along the coast that don't get severe frost and that don't get too cold. I've gone with the blood orange as our centrepiece. I love citrus. There's no garden that can be without one. Just as a little bit of a middle story, we're going with the gooseberries. They'll grow up to, again, about a metre high. You can keep them about that height and they'll provide some beautiful fruit. Our ground cover, I've decided to go with these baby sunrose. They're a, a, a real succulent sort of leaf that you can use in salad and they pop up a beautiful red flower, which is edible too. I hope these examples have given you a little bit of inspiration to go out there, play around with some combinations and create an edible garden at your place. After the break, our backyard revolution begins. Are you in? Yes! All right. You may remember earlier in the show, I mentioned our backyard revolution. My 10-part plan to create a productive, abundant and sustainable garden. <laughs> Meet the Tembaleskis. Your typical Austro, Yugo, Greek salad family from the suburbs. There's Mum. Dad. My turn? Who's going to push me? Little sis. <laughs> and the boys. <laughs> the Tembaleskis have been chosen from hundreds of applicants to have me design and build them the ultimate family garden. <laughs> and the good news is I'll be the first to tell them. Kane Tembaleski. Hello. Hey, hey guys, how you going? Good. <laughs> nice, nice to meet you. Good day, Christopher. <laughs> Hello. What's your name? Christopher. Christopher and Raphael. Raphael, you must be Jonathan. <laughs> I've heard about you. And who's this little one? Elena. Hello, Elena. So you realise that we've looked all around the place and we've had lots of families apply, but guess what? You guys are the ones. We're going to fix your garden. Yeah! <laughs> what do you think of that? Yeah! <laughs> are you in? Yeah! All right, hands in. One, two, three. <laughs> the Tembaleskis are your classic multicultural Aussie family. Angela moved here from Greece nine years ago and Kane's parents are originally from Yugoslavia. Having met while working together on a super yacht in Greece, Kane was smitten from the very first glance, describing Angela as his very own Sophia Loren. Four vibrant boys and one beautiful daughter later, and the Tembaleskis are a loving family and the perfect choice to help us create our backyard revolution. Although I'll be completely redesigning this space, the gardening bug is already well and truly established in the Tembaleskis. Now, Christopher, I hear you like gardening. Yep. Is that right? Yep. What do you like about it? I like to see the way the plants grow and I uh, like planting the plants. Yeah? Gee, but despite Christopher's like best that. efforts, yeah. not all of the plantings have been a runaway success. It's got a this is an olive tree. tree. <laughs> we only got one olive last year out of it. It was having a quiet year. There used to be some spinach here, but they died in the hop. What's in this box? Sunflowers, but they haven't grown at all. Yeah. Recycling is high on the Tembaleski's agenda, with both Kane and the kids getting in on the act. Kane doing his best with a homemade grey water system. Well, as you can see, it's a bit of improvisation. What I've done is if I pull this out, I can 
put that in there like that, and I just do the grass. So I, I move this around. Uh, we average about two washings a day, so that's what, over 100 litres a day. Right, yeah. And it's been working? It's worked magic. I've never watered the grass. Although Kane's heart is in the right place, using untreated grey water on your garden will cause more harm than good. What have we got here, guys? Uh, this is a recycling water. Yeah? So whose idea was this? My idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of us. Fantastic. You know, and this is this is this is nice work. This is your own little water tank. Yes. Yep. So what other things have you got in the garden? Oh, we have a compost bin. Come. Really? Yeah. Come, come and look at it. Come and look at it. Okay. So when did you start composting? Uh, about a month ago. Really? Yeah. Well, we saw it on your show and you told us it's good for the garden. <laughs> Every side passage and backyard across the country has a history. There was a holiday on the south coast and we collected shells. There was a dream here with these posts. We're going to build a new pergola of some description and it's going to be great. But that weekend just never came. We've run around and worn out the grass. So we've covered it with fake grass. But the beauty of walking around and being a part of, of this, this family history is that it just needs a little bit of a tweak. And of course, when redesigning an entire garden, the first place to start is to find out what the owners want from it. To be more self-sufficient. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the moment, we're spending a lot of money, extra money, at the fruit markets, so we want to be able to grow our own stuff. Angela cooks a lot of the Greek traditional foods, and the boys had a taste of that when they went to see their their grandmother back in Greece, so we want to we want to implement that here. And Angela, well, that might be what Mum and Dad want, but what about the boys? So, guys, how do you use this space? Is this like your your, your racetrack? Yeah. yeah. We start from up here. We go like this. We we'll start racing. Yeah. And where's the track? We go around there, then up again. We play soccer here. Soccer. Yep. Oh. Oh. Okay. So you want some grass here? Yeah. Yep. I'd also like to. Extend the garden into here. Get rid of all this concrete. Yeah. Okay, so so this is not so special. No, it's not. We don't play here. Not at all. Now, that leaves one last thing, guys. Trampoline. Do we keep it or move it? Keep it. Keep it. There it is. <laughs> now, there's a couple of little tasks. Who's up for jobs? Me. First of all, Dad, all the rubbish has to go into a bin. And what we'll do, in a week's time, we'll weigh it and see how much it is, and then we can watch what happens. <laughs> Chris, I need you to go out and write down what's on the water meter every day. Sure. And Raph, I need you to keep your little sister happy. So just give her your ear and she'll pull on it. And then guess what? We're going to start. Yeah! See ya. Bye! Next week on Costa's Garden Odyssey, a garden paradise out of Africa. This place is alive with a whole different vocabulary of edible plants. How to grow fruit, vegetables and barramundi on your balcony. In the middle of the city and you can grow veggies and fish and that's astonishing. An unusual water solution for a very special family. Thank you so much. This is so good. Thank you. Really. Pleasure. Plus, stage one of our backyard revolution.